1. Here's the story. My younger sister Layla and I both worked in different departments at a big grocery chain. Eventually, after a few years, my department got dissolved, and I basically got thrown into a new department that I hated. So I ended up quitting and finding a new job as a cashier at a tiny health food store. Layla, on the other hand, ended up thriving at the big grocery store. She was and is smart and ambitious, so began to work up the ranks, and eventually she landed in a new position where she worked closely with HR in the hiring process. So back to me at the tiny health food store. I ended up loving the store, and eventually worked up the ranks myself to manage the entire grocery department. All the staff were super chill and easy to get along with, and passionate except one person, the assistant store manager, Jeff. Jeff was not exactly a jerk right off the bat, but over time, he did things that made me begin to dislike him. For example, he would tell staff off for talking too much and not working, even though he would always stand around and talk with random people instead of working most days. He was also lazy about training staff, but then would get mad that we didn't know how to do things. He was also not professional. He would always share his unwanted political opinions. He was a very right-wing libertarian when most staff were more left-leaning, and his thoughts on the COVID vaccine, he literally said, I shouldn't have to get vaccinated just because fat people won't stop eating Twinkies. Yikes. He also had a crush on one of the female managers and was constantly talking to her and flirting with her, which she didn't appreciate. He would also talk badly about the store manager behind his back and tell us all that he would run the store way better if he was in charge. For some reason, he decided he didn't like me pretty early on, probably because I'm an expert at grey rocking around the Jeffs of the world. When I applied to become the grocery department manager after working as the assistant manager of the department for a full year, he literally came up to me and told me who else applied and how he didn't think I would get the job, because everyone else who applied was so much more qualified. I did, because the store manager knew Jeff was a dumbass. After my promotion, he would often criticize how I was managing the department, even though it was his job to train me. He barely did any training at all, so I literally had to teach myself how to do almost everything. Any positive improvements I made were completely ignored, such as the fact sales in my department increased while I was managing it, and numerous customers were complimenting the fact that I was bringing in new products. To Jeff, my management wasn't that great, and it would have been way better if he had gotten to pick who got my job. Here's how he became the ex-boss. Three or four employees, including the female manager he was harassing and myself, ended up reporting him to HR for harassment and other unprofessionalism. Jeff either got fired or quit during the investigation. I never really bothered to find out because I was mainly happy he was no longer there. It was like the clouds parted, the sun came out and morale of the store shot up. Someone new took Jeff's job and began doing a fantastic job as assistant store manager by actually training people and building a positive work environment by giving people constructive criticism, rather than gossiping about them constantly. Sales also improved, something Jeff claimed would not happen because he acted like the whole store would fall apart without him there and everything was great. We all just forgot about him. Until one day, months after Jeff's disappearance, Layla called while I was at work. I went on my lunch break and called her back and she says, Hey, we're looking at resumes from people applying for some big management position at their store. And there's one that says he worked at Tiny Health Food Store for six years. So I wanted to know if you worked with him and if he's a good employee. Is his name Jeff Wienerbutz? I asked. Yes, she said. Now, I know technically I was not listed as a reference or Jeff's supervisor, so you're probably wondering why I got the call. Basically, the management there remembered I was Layla's sister and that I was a good former employee. Apparently, Layla had been spreading positive rumors after I left about me getting promoted to manager at Tiny Health Food Store and doing a fantastic job because she was hoping to get them to ask me to come back there. So, when a former employee of Tiny Health Food Store applied... Apparently, they thought I was the best person to ask. Now, I also didn't want my sister working around Jeff, so I did my best to make sure that he was not an attractive candidate at all. 
to avoid sounding too disgruntled or negative, I started with how Jeff was good at some parts of his job. In between the good parts, I sprinkled in bits about how he was a jerk, he was negative, overly critical, unprofessional, and bad-talked upper management. I finally added that he, allegedly, may have harassed female employees. Full emphasis because I didn't want to get sued. By the time I was done, my lunch break was then over, so I had to go back to work. Layla texted me five minutes later that the store manager wasn't even going to bother giving Jeff an interview. According to LinkedIn, he still hasn't found a job. 2. I got a spam text message. One of the obvious scam lead-ins asking, Hello, is this Jessica's phone? I assumed it was a scam attempt, but to be civil I replied politely that it was not. Got a series of follow-up messages explaining their assistant must have copied the number incorrectly and apologizing for the inconvenience and introducing themselves and asking for my name. At which point I was certain that it was an attempt to scam me. So I said that I would not be providing my name and they continued to try to engage me in conversation. So I explained who I am, a parent with a child who suffered from a life-threatening illness and that I had to spend staggering sums of money on her care. And since I had done him no wrong, he was trying to defraud me of money. I kept coming back to this. Next time you look in the mirror, make a note that this is what a person looks like who tries to steal money from the parent of a sick child. I figured if there was any humanity there, I might get the chance to live rent-free in their head for a while. Or maybe even encourage them to take up a more honorable profession. An hour or more passed and they came back to talk to me about how I was in the USA and our imperialism was responsible for all the world's problems, etc. At which point I replied that my assumption was that he was in China, and while I might not like how the Chinese government treats the people of Hong Kong, Tibet, or its Uyghur population, that wouldn't justify my trying to steal from a random person in Shanghai. I sent that and heard nothing further. I decided to follow up and troll a bit more and none of the messages went through. Then it dawned on me. I said Hong Kong, Tibet, and Uyghur in the same sentence to a guy in China. I'm pretty sure that's a trifecta to hit their police state monitoring system, so he might be getting a bit more attention from the local authorities than he was already looking for. I don't know for sure, and I probably never will, but it makes me feel good to know that I may have accidentally done just about the only thing that could cause the guy to get in trouble locally. If you're wondering why I think this guy was in China, there are a few reasons. One is that he gave his name as Luan. Another is the references to US imperialism and the language usage were familiar to me from other anti-USA screeds I've read that were written by Chinese people. Also, this exact type of scam was written up as an example in a major newspaper. New York Times, Washington Post? I've done some cursory searches but can't find the article and the perpetrator was identified by law enforcement as originating from China. My thinking that the guy may have gotten into trouble is that in the event a live person ever reviews the message traffic, it may merit a referral to law enforcement. 3. I'm a 30-year-old female and am from country A, and a few years ago I was hired by a company in country B. I had to move to country B for a few months in order to be trained for the job, and then I could go back home to keep working remotely. I was hired more or less at the same time as a few other people from my country. As a result, the company had to find a suitable accommodation to put us in for several weeks. And so hotels were not an option. They found apartments for rent, and put two employees from country A in each apartment. I was the last employee from country A to be hired, and as a result, I was accommodated in the only apartment that still had a free spot with a roommate from my country, Jeff, a 32-year-old male. Cued my first stay in Country B, I was picked up at the train station after a long plane ride, and Jeff and others were kind enough to come get me to walk me to the apartment building we were all sharing. During the walk, Jeff kept telling me how long he had spent cleaning the apartment to make it ready for me, and I was thankful. However, when we got to the apartment, it was nasty, full of dirt, and what I want to assume were Jeff's beard hairs scattered around the place. The toilet was disgusting, the kitchen was sticky up to the ceiling. So I spent my first few days cleaning everything behind Jeff's back so as not to offend him. 
Some people's standards of cleanliness are different, and I thought nothing of it. Weeks passed, and Jeff never cleaned again. He was incredibly messy, never cleaned after himself, walked in dirty mud boots all around the house, never did a single dish, never washed his bed sheets, barely showered, often forgot to flush the toilet after using it, never opened a single window to air the house, etc. I was absolutely disgusted and anxious the entire time I lived there. And I cleaned the house like a sick person each day to keep it livable for me. On our last night there, before returning to our home country, I packed my suitcases, washed all the towels, linens, clothes, floors, surfaces, appliances, everything. Jeff chose to get pissing drunk instead and not pack his suitcase or clean his room because he said it would take him ten minutes the next morning. The next morning I got a knock on the door at approximately 9am, it was our boss, coming to pick up Jeff because his flight was early in the morning. He was going to a different part of our country. Jeff was asleep in his dirty room and I had to wake him up. He panicked, threw a few things in his suitcase and ran for the door. Before he left, I asked if he intended on cleaning his bedroom as promised, and he begged me to do it because I'm a better cleaner and he was in too much of a rush. I called him a pig and he left. Cue my revenge. I spent several weeks cleaning after him, not complaining to not come across as annoying, and just putting my head down and cleaning to make the house livable for me. I was so done, and did not want to pick up any more hair or dirt coming from this man's body. So I called our boss, I explained the situation. The company had told us to leave the apartment spotless, otherwise they wouldn't get their deposits back. My boss came to the house to check Jeff's room and was appalled at what he saw. He profusely apologized to me and went to the supermarket and bought some new cleaning supplies. He even brought a hoover from his own house. He spent the next few hours scrubbing the room on his hands and knees. He threw out the clothes and personal items Jeff had forgotten. And best of all, a few weeks after seeing Jeff's performance was completely subpar, he fired Jeff. If he hadn't been such a terrible human, he might have helped him get better at the job, but he chose to fire him instead. Long story short, Jeff ruined his own chances at a very good job, and I was thanked over and over again for putting up with the situation so gracefully. I got a raise shortly after, so long story short, don't be a pig. It can have bigger consequences than expected. 4. So I'm a 28-year-old female, just been in North Wales to see my family for a week. As I live and work in London, I booked my train from Bangor to Euston days in advance, making sure I'd have a seat reserved. My mom drove me and my cat in her carrier the hour drive to the station and waved us off. As getting a cat carrier, a suitcase and a stuffed tote bag in is quite a challenge, once I scouted out my seat reserved from Bangor, I quickly plunked myself down, my cat carrier on my lap, my tote and suitcase washed against my legs. So if someone sat next to me, they had their leg space. At the next stop, an elderly woman asked if anyone was sitting by me, to which I replied, not at the moment, and as long as she didn't mind the cat. She said she wasn't faced by this and sat down. We made small talk, and I went back to window watching. The train was filling up at this point, and it was clear that the journey had been overbooked. The next station comes, and two middle-aged women get on. They start looking at their tickets, and their one seat is the aisle over, whilst another one is where the elderly woman is sitting next to me. They start loudly discussing someone being in their booked seat from station C, and looking directly at me and drawing the attention of the carriage. One thing to note is that I have a seizure disorder, I have a disabled person's rail card, and I wear a lanyard that says, please offer me a seat which I only use on long journeys, or if I'm feeling a wee bit wobbly that day. The conversation went so. You need to move, you're in my seat. Hi, no, uh, I'm in the one next to yours, the one from Station A. At this point, I'm trying to be diplomatic about the fact that it's in fact the elderly woman occupying their seat, but she just seems oblivious. No, you're in the one from Station C, that's my friend's seat, and I'm the one on this side of the aisle, where the man is. The man has got up to move, but looks worriedly at me in my lanyard. I moved over to his seat, from the one next to me here, but I got on at station A, where this train was booked from. I don't mind moving, but I need to ask the conductor where I can sit. 
Yes, well, you're younger than us, so you really should stand up, shouldn't you? Yes, you really should stand up. Well, I actually need to sit because I have a seizure disorder. Ugh. Don't we all have something these days? The elderly woman punts at my lanyard. I don't think she's lying. The middle-aged women see this and look a mixture of annoyed and embarrassed. Well, you can't stay here. Conduct her. She's in my seat. At this point, my cat is meowing like crazy. She isn't an official seizure awareness pet, but she picks up on my stress levels, and I think this may have added to her sudden behavior change, as she was previously asleep. The middle-aged women are telling the conductor I should move out of the seat as I am younger. I try to explain to the conductor that I'm happy to move, but I just need to sit somewhere if possible. The conductor cuts them off and asks me if I need help with my bags and if the cat is okay. I tell her she's picking up on my stress. I don't want her to carry my bags because they're heavy. The middle-aged women look smug and I'm removed from my seat and told to follow the conductor. So I stumble along the staring eyes of the carriage like a naughty school kid, trying to keep my breathing steady. She opens the last door and guides me into the first-class coach. She tells me to take a seat, apologizes for the situation, tells me I can sit here for the remaining three hours and offers me a bottle of water. I take it, stunned, and say I didn't book first class and I have a cat. She smiles and says she knows, and would I like a chocolate too. So yes, I am younger, but that doesn't mean I should automatically stand, and not all disabilities are visibly obvious. So don't be a prick. It ain't easy being seasy, but sometimes it pays off. 5. This is an ongoing story. My friends live in a house that is in front of a bus depot. Entrance one side, exit the other. For years, with permission of the owner, they park their cars beside the house, along the wide part of the exit for the depot. It was convenient, and friendly relations meant my friends did not complain when diesel engines fired up in the early hours to warm up outside their bedroom windows. A couple of decades later, the business is taken over by a national chain. And with that comes a number of changes. New tall fences that obstruct views, gates on the entrance and exit, more buses stored that require more maneuvering, and more young, underexperienced drivers. When moving buses, they regularly clipped a fence post, moving them from the exit to the entrance of the depot. The road was narrow with a big hedge on the other side. It was not a task to perform carelessly. After a couple of broken fences, eventually the wooden post was replaced with a sturdy reinforced concrete equivalent and the driver stopped hitting it in a hurry. Another change that came down the pipe shortly after, the owners required my friends stop parking on the depot grounds. They wanted the space for their own staff. After asking if there was another space that would be acceptable, they were told in no uncertain terms that the cars would not be on the property at all under any circumstances. Cue malicious compliance. And with it, the dawning realization for management that there was a reason the previous owner had been so accommodating. Because now they park their cars outside the front of the house instead. As the law does not allow parking on the sidewalk, they must be parked on the road proper. So they absolutely block about half the narrow road. Consequently, the long buses could no longer pull out from the exit and turn across the house without hitting the cars. If they needed to go on a route in that direction, or just pull a bus around to the entrance. Now they have to turn the other way and drive a couple of miles around country lanes instead. The impact was felt immediately. The depot's managers called the police to complain about the obstruction. The police not only confirmed that the cars are parked legally, but that they must not obstruct the sidewalk. So they could not be parked closer in. Management also petitioned the local council to have that part of the road designated for no parking. But that has been fought off successfully. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream, episode 291. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please do poke the like button.
And if you'd like to get the videos a little bit early, you can support me on a monthly basis through my Patreon, which is linked in the description. You'll also find links to the Hellfreezer merchandise store on Teespring. And I understand a monthly commitment's not for everyone, so you can make tips or donations, depending on how you want to phrase it, during streams or videos just like this one. You don't have to do this, but I appreciate it, and it helps me keep things running around here. Okay, no other business today, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... Footwear, do you prefer to tie laces, or do you like shoes you can just slip on? Like, my favourite footwear right now, kind of worn out, so I do need to replace some, is it's a pair of New Balance sneakers, or trainers for those of you in my country, and uh, they've got laces on them, but they're I don't really use them. They're kind of just tied loose enough, and they're they're kind of elastic enough, these, these, these sneakers. I can just slip them on and off, and th that is why I wear them so much. I initially got them for working out, uh, which, you know, that will happen one day kind of has to happen to be honest with you uh, but I wear them more often just for doing everything it became my go-to uh, just because they were easy to get on and off so I guess I, I prefer slip-ons but other options are available so why don't you let me know what you think in a comment below and with that I'm gonna head off for now so until next time thank you very much for listening and take very good care of yourselves <laughs>